Hello, and I've got a lot to talk about this video as we review Picard Episode 4, Absolute Candor. So I'm going to start with a spoiler full review and then touch on some old lore about the various religions we've heard from in the Romulan culture. There's a lot of development around the mysteries of Soji's purpose and some clarification of the Zatvash's intent. At the centre of it is the assimilation of the Shainor that coincided with the severance of the Borg cube from the Collective. Meanwhile, Narek clarifies his mission is to use Soji to learn of the whereabouts of perhaps even more synthetic people. I'm warming to Soji a bit more this episode as we see her trying to unwrap an enigma that she is unaware she is the central component of. Although her goofing off with Narek had me cringing somewhat, but that's because I'm a grump and the kind of guy who would shout, GET OFF MY LAWN DAMN KIDS! I appreciate the frivolity, but my Trek-tempered mind kept me from enjoying the moment by screaming, Borg Cube! Danger! Don't provoke the Borg! But I'm glad the Borg ritual that Narek alluded to was nonsense. My heart did sink when he started going on about the Borg having a culture. But fears were unfounded. Picard gets another flashback sequence, this one on Vashti, a Romulan colony of nuns who took in some of the relocated refugees when the evacuations were in full swing. Kindly Grandad Picard is quite a juxtaposition to the character as we knew him within TNG, but Picard has always consoled himself about his lack of family with the ideas that his brother had the Picard legacy covered. Of course, that was all lost in Star Trek Generations, with the death of Robert leading him to lament his solitude. It makes sense that the ageing man would seek a surrogate family in others, and perhaps he sees some of this in the young Elnor and the Asher twins. Equally, I understand Elnor's resentment of Picard, having been missing for 14 years, but I'm glad that he seems mature enough to understand that it wasn't all Picard's fault. I'm thinking this will be tension between the two, however, as Picard does seem to dislike the direction Elnor's life has taken as a warrior, and honestly, Picard's self-imposed exile in Lebert, France is partly responsible for him not being around these last 14 years. We also meet up with the Kuat Milat. I noticed a lot of very old Japanese-inspired visuals in these shots, with blossoming trees, weapon racks hidden in the background, and the Kualat Milat seem to practice a lot of weaving, judging by their paraphernalia, and practice a way of life that's not overly reliant on technology. Elnor, in particular, has very strong Ronin samurai influences, with the neat black robe, tied cloth boots, hair bun, and Tangalang sword, which looks very similar to a katana. Although, yes, he does look like a fantasy elf, but stick a Vulcan or a Romulan in a robe and give them a sword and, well, that's going to be true for the lot. It seems that the Quatmalat were based on Vashti in the Kiris Sector Beta Quadrant before the supernova and took in a number of refugees, including the young Elnor. As a male, he would be unable to join the Sisterhood, but is still trained by them as an unofficial member of sorts, and he pledges himself to Picard's mission. As for the way of absolute candour, I think that it has a silly name, and I imagine it leads to some awkward situations at times. Although over time, however, I imagine it probably tempers people's emotional state when they have to constantly speak their mind. It's also in opposition to standard Romulan practice, and interestingly, also against the Vulcan way of logic, that both often have people repressing their true feelings and intentions. We also get to see a traditional Romulan warbird from the 2270s era of the Star Empire, and it is mentioned as being an antique ship. Still, it is a fearsome match for a small vessel like the La Serena, and it has a bit of an updated look to it, which I'm not going to lie, had me grinning with nostalgia. This Karkantar seems to be a crime lord or gang member who has forced out the previous faction of Fenris Rangers, which sounds like a Romulan-connected faction. Fenris being named similarly to the famed wolf Fenrir of Norse mythology, and Romulus and Remus being the wolf pack raised children of Roman law. As for the warbird itself, I'm not sure as to the current situation, but in non canon tales, many former military assets wound up in civilian use, especially with the supernova causing the remnants of the military to hoard as many up to date ships as they could. This left the civilian populace to use whatever old ships they could find. I've noticed there is a lot of world building and background terminology dropped in dialogue and open to assumption in this series, and it's not letting off. 
which I love, but it has led to some issues. What we are seeing is the result of the supernova as there is no time for yet another exposition dump to flesh out the past 20 years of turmoil. Suffice to say that it appears to be drawing on inspirations from other Trek works that depicted the collapse of the Star Empire and the formation of numerous movements and breakaway nations. We have had mention of the Romulan Free State, who run the Borg Reclamation Project, and now the Rebirth Movement, who feel abandoned by the Federation. The scattering of their people due to the half-hearted Federation evacuation has left them without the support they were promised, and the Rebirth Movement in particular feels that, in their moment of panic, swayed by Admiral Picard's words, they were taken advantage of by the Federation. A paranoid stance to be sure, but one grounded in observation of the results and a very Romulan way of thinking. I'm liking this exposure to a side of the Star Trek universe which we hear about but don't often witness, how difficult things can be for people without using the Federation. The relationship between Narek and his sister is very uncomfortable to watch. I guess that is the point as I think it's Narek's discomfort that makes it so, but still. What's going on here? The tone is borderline incestuous and I can't take it seriously. And the cameo at the end has little to go on right now, but after playing Star Trek Online where Jerry Ryan played a 2399 era 7 of 9, I can tell you that this is a very different Seven who has spent the last 20 years humanising. Her speech is more colloquial and less precise than it was, so be ready for that going forwards. So, this episode sees us exposed to a hitherto unknown layer of Romulan society, that of the Kuat Milat, a sort of religion or sect of Romulans who follow the way of absolute candour and practice combat like warrior monks. Only this group is traditionally women, meaning that Elnor, for however much training he has, will never officially join their ranks. Religion among the Romulans has been a part of their society since the original series of novels, with many following a belief in the five elements – fire, earth, water, air and arch element, which is the guiding force behind the others. This belief may have been a continuation of a lost Vulcan belief, as their cousins embraced the logical Surak's teachings while those who marched beneath the raptor's wings left on their exodus. There is also the Deera, meaning Endless Sky, and this was the primary belief that unified the early Romulans during the sundering from their original homeworld. It is said that beings from Vorta Vor, a Romulan heaven, told the early Vulcans that they were to inherit the stars, that they would be the superior species. Eventually the Vulcans lost this belief with their awakening to logic, but many in Romulus and Remus still hold true to the way of Deera, thinking themselves superior to all others. Whether or not this is still a conscious creed that they follow, however, is unknown. It did serve some good though for the Romulans, as it preached that this divine right could only be obtained through unity, and is likely what saw them through their turbulent early times. There are also references to a polytheistic religion and numerous other traditions that have been written into canon over the years, as well as originating in extra sources. For example, the reasoning given for Nero's tattooed appearance was a tradition among Romulans to get a small tattoo for a lost loved one that wouldn't last, so that as time passed the tattoo faded until it was gone. Nero and his crew decided to get a whole lot of them to mourn the loss of Romulus in its entirety. So. Just as humans have a variety of beliefs and religions over time, the Romulan culture too has had its own early ways of trying to understand the universe. But many of these beliefs have faded with time, especially due to the rise in the Romulan Star Empire's focus on military might and conquest, and the gradual suppression of many of its citizens' ideals that could conflict with loyalty to the Empire. Organisations such as the Tau Shi'ar would also police the Romulan populace, and while often allowed certain beliefs to persist, they didn't exactly encourage it. Alongside this were Spock's efforts to reunify the Vulcans and Romulus, a small segment began to embrace the teachings of Surak too. Again, much of this was not seen in the show, but still adds flavouring to the species. Many of these beliefs were seen only among the civilian populace, which helps explain why they're so seldom seen on screen. So as Romulan specialist Ramda was also narrating, there is also a strong mythology in their culture which included legends of the Gamandan, 
or the Day of Annihilation, which saw the Destroyer free the chained demons and begin an apocalyptical event. I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that this is the driving belief behind the Zadvash's hatred of artificial life, as that's how they believe this mythology is to be interpreted. As for the Kuatmalat Sisterhood, they train Kulankahai, warriors who follow their teachings and will undertake numerous altruistic roles of protection. Occasionally one can petition their order for aid, but they will only agree to pledge if they judge the cause worthy. They say it has to be a lost cause, and there is an understanding among the Sisterhood that the Kulankahai have a high mortality rate once they undertake such a quest. So, that's my analysis and critique of the information added by Absolute Candor. I did have to watch it several times to pick up on a lot of that information that flies by, and I can see that the series has a solid backstory foundation which it's using to flesh out its world. But if I have a criticism of the series so far, it would be that there is so much lore to uncover in such a short amount of time, and the series is growing increasingly reliant on that world. The series is assuming that the viewer is absorbing all of this at breakneck speed, and maybe if I were an android then I'd get it all on one pass without further research. Personally, I'd rather this approach than the discovery direction of just winging it with its own retcons, but that is because I've been following stories such as Star Trek Online, and I'm completely used to seeing different factions of Romulans, Borg technology being studied, ancient religions and myths coming to life, and a conflicted Starfleet. To me, I can look at elements of Picard and say, oh, that's like this from Online, but a bit different. But that's the problem. Very few people play things like Star Trek Online, and Picard is a hard introduction into a Star Trek universe 20 years from when we last visited it on screens. That two decade gap has had a lot happen, and we're seeing its effects, but it's a lot to juggle alongside the main narrative of Star Trek Picard, especially in only 10 episodes. I'll keep on top of the lore reveals as they come, but as I said, this is mostly built off assumption and what other authors have extrapolated in their own works, but it lines up with what we're seeing in Picard. As for the show itself, I know not everyone needs this level of background detail and just wants to be entertained, and on this front, I think the series is doing fine, but I would not recommend this as someone's first foray into Star Trek as even people with a passing knowledge of the next generation may struggle to keep up with its rapid delivery. When the series is done, I foresee several lists of Star Trek episodes to watch to understand Picard appearing, and I'll probably make one myself. Thanks for watching this review and lore dive. I've been Rick, and I'll see you next time. Joel Andrew.